welcome to this week's video which is so exciting because we have two awesome brand new authors russell and celine here to talk to us today everyone give us the words <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a really awesome evening where we're just going to chat about their fantastic new book which is very large and very awesome ocean endangered <laughs> well look at that we've got the copy <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, a, a really awesome book it's really awesome for this channel um i uh we've I have lots of marine books that I like to shout out. And when um, Russell and Celine got in contact to tell me about their new fantastic books that I could get to check out and read, I jumped at the chance and got them on the channel so that we can all chat about it and just hear more about the creation of this awesome book. But I am first going to tell you a bit about how I felt, what it is. I'm going to give my own description and then Russell and Celine can jump in and correct me if that's not what the book, book is at all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, from reading all of these other books, it is, you know, from the cover, it is absolutely covered in ocean creatures and it is full of amazing pictures and walks you through the entire ocean from the coast to the deep sea. But unlike some of the other books I've read, this is a totally people kind of based book. It is written from the point of view of how we as humans are interacting with all of those different levels of the ocean. They are very informative very blunt about the realities that the ocean is facing at the moment and kind of take you through this journey of how humans are connected to the ocean and how we are having an impact but then kind of also give you you know how awesome the oceans are and how we can protect it and giving that information to people I think is really important and I just think it's a, a really lovely book so hopefully that's kind of what 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 I think. But we're going to ask uh, Russell and Celine lots of questions this evening and get right to the the the, the bottom of how they came up with such a good book. So um, yeah, what inspired you both to write this? And do you want to give your own kind of descriptions of of what you think this book is uh, for people? What you know this book is because you wrote it. <laughs> okay, cool. Shall I sh shall I go? Go for it. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Russell. Um, uh, so Flame Tree, who are the publisher, uh, contacted us and said, we'd really like you to write a book about the ocean uh, called Ocean Endangered. And we want you to put basically, we want it to be like a pretty picture book and we want it to talk about the state of the oceans. And they thought, so originally they were like, oh, we want a chapter on like the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, you know, the Atlantic. And I was like, that sounds a bit, A, quite didactic and like quite like at school where like, oh, all the oceans and things and going around. And I guess also it sounded really depressing. <laughs> so I, instantly I was like, can can we tweak that idea slightly? Uh, so, and we can talk a bit more about what, what, what like I guess our process that we came around. But we what, we wanted it to be, brutally honest but also not super neggy and so it we hope that it's like solutions focused mm -hmm. and and empowering i guess that's 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 what we and um, inspiring and empowering that's kind of what we aim for so celine any thoughts is that is that about right <laughs> that's that's pretty much it yeah it, it comes down to the the issue often when we present problems with environmental um issues is that we don't give the solutions and so we wanted to really highlight um that there are solutions that we are aware of there are new things that are being developed every day and we kind of structured each of the chapters where we introduced the ecosystem then we talked about the issues and the threats for each ecosystem and we finished by giving um certain solutions or positive examples and case studies that were already in place to kind of leave on a positive note. And that's what I thought was really important. Yeah, I think that really came across because it is so people and planet based and, and but it's because you're learning about what we're doing, you're then immediately learning about what we can do to change it, which is which is really nice. It just flows really uh, nicely um, through all of that. I mean, that must be pretty cool to have someone to reach out and be like, do you want to write a book? <laughs> Yeah, it was good. I mean, it, I, I, it was quite stressful, I guess, because it was a great opportunity and it's something that I've always wanted to do. 
but I was, you know, in the middle of my PhD write up and, you know, just sat in front of a computer writing uh, what, what ended up becoming a 106,000 word tome about phytoplankton. And I didn't want to add to my workload and time in front of a computer with all the lockdowns and things like that. Um, so I was like, I would really like to write this with someone. So it's more of an interactive experience. So um, Celine had recently uh, graduated and had sent me her thesis to kind of give a once over. And I normally reading a thesis is quite an arduous task. I actually really enjoyed Celine's thesis and I was like, it was really well written and it was quite enjoyable. So I was like, hey, Celine, do you want to do you want to write this together? And she was like, you're OK. <laughs> yeah, pretty much it was a well, it was thanks to Russell because he proposed it. And um, yeah, I just finished and it was a bit of a crazy time. And I also found out that I had a work opportunity in France. So in the end, it was all a bit stressful, but we can talk about the kind of weird circumstances under which we ended up writing the book, which are actually quite funny. Um, yeah, isn't that always the way? It's never, at the, you know, there's never an ideal time. Well, that should be, is that a phrase? It's never an ideal time to be asked to write a book. <laughs> I think so, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's really cool. Um, I know, it was, yes, I was going to say, it was like, it was really playing on my mind. And I was like, trying to pigeonhole times to sit down and write it and kept getting distracted. And so in the end, uh, we were like, right, we just need to sit down and blitz this. So we just got some time and um, so we were like, we want to be near the sea where we write yes. this. So originally I proposed going to, to Bath University where I was and we had like run of the library and we were going to stay in a youth hostel that was the idea and we were just going to like blitz it over a week and i thought we're going to be in the library it's surrounded by books we'll absorb all that by osmosis and then we thought it'd actually be really nice to write it near the sea being that it's about the ocean so uh celine's grandparents they, they got yeah, stuck yeah. in italy or something no well they have like a they have a, a second flat in in the uk not far from brighton where i live and they weren't there at the time, so I proposed to Russell that we, we went and wrote it there. And so that's what, what happened. We we finally, we all looked at our calendars. We were like, oh, I'm busy here. You're busy here. Oh, wait, we have these four days in common. <laughs> like, so Russell arrived on a train in the morning, and then we had, like, four days. And we just, yeah. yeah it was an cool. intense experience. <laughs> we, we, got, we got all the food in, and yes. uh, it was all health healthy food, which is great. And... Uh, we just we just sat in Celine's grandparents' like Small granny thing. flat yeah. in in Eastbourne, and it was all put post-it notes everywhere. And um, like, and it, I think what was really good for me is I have ADHD, so I was forever just like, oh no, no. And Celine was like, get back on task, Russell. <laughs> okay. No, but we also used the, we used the Pomodoro technique that you introduced to me then, which has served me since very well in my studies, where we did twenty minutes of writing. And then five minute break, we stood up, we like jumped around a bit, we sat back down and yeah. it worked really well, actually. Oh, and it was good because uh, every 25 minutes I'd be like, this is what I've written, what do you think? Yeah. So we have it this. And um, we, because we were near the coast, we also thought it was really important to like engage with the coast. So we, we did a beach clean every day while we, while we wrote it. So we, we went down to Eastbourne and we spent at least an hour, hour and a half walking along the uh walking along the Eastbourne coast and just clearing crap off of it which was good oh I like that I mean that's so nice that you had like this great experience stressful intense four days but like that you've got to remember that for ages as well which is nice that you get that attached to the course of the book as well which is really cool <laughs> I love that you did a beach clean yeah and we we really wanted to keep in the ocean theme so even in the evenings we took a small break and we watched like ocean themed films i think we watched my octopus teacher yeah that had just come out else. hadn't it yeah yeah and then we were just like really in the ocean theme like 24 hours a day right. it was it was quite great and, and the other the other really nice thing is that uh i guess celine went to a brighton library and got out every single book about the ocean <laughs> Uh, and it was really nice then because we had these books, which meant we didn't end up going down rabbit holes in the Internet. And obviously mm -hmm. the books have been fact checked and have been referenced and things. So we knew 
that when we were like getting a fact from somewhere that it wasn't just so like some weird hearsay that you've had found on wikipedia or we had to where did that where did that reference come from and things so so that was really nice having these other kind of more academic books to to draw upon so yes i will i will vouch for the fact that it doesn't feel like you've written it from wikipedia upon reading it <laughs> yeah we we tried to use if anything we tried to use the, the internet as little as possible to write it it was only if it was something that was like really like up to date or one of us remembered a, a, a scientific paper from somewhere or we wanted something like i think i heard something about that somewhere but mm. but i mean it, that was a useful thing also being uh, attached to an academic institution meant that we did have access to all the cutting edge like research and uh, scientific papers so it was yeah so we tried obviously to make it as up to date and as relevant as possible by drawing upon new research as well so awesome oh that sounds so cool so i'm just looking at the questions that i have and I'm like how long did it take to write i'm just gonna say four days now <laughs> the rest of it didn't i'm just gonna <laughs> four days and then afterwards yeah. yeah we yeah. we didn't um, obviously finish everything in four days but i think we did we did a good job in those four days yeah i think we so there's 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 five different biomes and an intro and like uh we, we we can sort it out guys like solution thing at the end so we, we 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 kind of divvied them up and i was we were like okay what areas of the ocean do we know most about and uh yeah. and yeah and it was it was great because you know uh i'll be honest i i didn't really know anything about coral reefs but uh celine did and so i actually learned quite a lot on the process of writing this book which was really nice so Oh, yeah, same awesome. for me with the deep sea section. Like Russell knows all kinds of things, and obviously all the parts that involve plankton. Yeah, I um, try to get loads yeah. of plankton in every, oh, uh, every chapter. Really every chapter's got some notice. plankton. <laughs> well, they're <laughs> fundamental, so we had to make a point. Exactly. Exactly. No, I loved all the creatures in there. I noted some down as I was going through. I know I picked up the barnacles were in there, given that they are my favourite. I saw barn. I was like, check. <laughs> If you did pass that check, I'm not sure. <laughs> Most important bit. But you go you right. Can't you can't... Sorry, what I was, was going to say barnacles are awesome. I do really love barnacles. They are really good, and they're everywhere. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you ignore them, have you really gone around the whole ocean? Good job, <laughs> you, you did include them. <laughs> um, but yeah, from like barnacles, flying squid, coral reefs, like giant manta rays, whale sharks, plankton. Uh, seaweeds, uh, sea grasses. There's pretty much as as many uh, species you can chuck in the book without it just becoming a list. Uh, is included, <laughs> which is really good for anyone that has a favourite creature. You'll probably find it in there. Well, it was well, it was nice, I guess, having because it's a, a effectively a coffee table book. It was really nice having this bank of images, which really helped drive uh what i guess what animals featured in there so uh, we we had a thing that it was like it has to be a cool picture and we had access to these big like uh i guess visual libraries and so the this publisher chose half the images and we chose the other half mm -hmm. and the ones that they'd chosen already for us kind of thing it was interesting to then use those pictures to try and tell a story or to highlight uh uh something like a, like a highlight a point or make a point visually so yeah and it is chocolate can we we can show bits of let's do it yeah wow seagulls what have i got That's oh not some... seagull this gamut i'm okay, sorry there we go. What have I got? Oh, look at that! Yeah, I've got oh, a submarine. DC submersible. Oh, lovely. Oh, okay, what, look. Creature, what creature will Clownfish. I be turned into? Just the ocean. <laughs> What's this? What have we got? Yeah. yeah. Oh, What's this yeah. See, perfect for that, which is really cool. So, talking about like the publishing, like how long have you had to wait? Like, how long from getting writing to like waiting until you see this book in your hands? <laughs> over, over a year. <gasps> yeah, because we we finalised it in October, November, twenty twenty. So yeah. Yeah, that's and um, it was originally supposed to be out on World Ocean Day, uh, yes. which would have been you know, which is June the sixth. 
Mm. And uh, no, June the eighth. Right, that's eighth. really embarrassing. Yeah. No, I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> June the 8th. Oh, it's COVID, it's June the 8th. right? It's June the 8th. Is it? Yeah. it is, good, yeah, okay. Twice. Was... You could have done it on the 6th and then been like, oh, yeah, we'll try yeah. again on <laughs> the 8th. Yeah, you know, just drag it out. Um, but yeah, it was supposed to be that, but the COVID has caused like a massive backlog in uh, shipping. So I believe it was printed in China. So, uh, which I was, you know, we had no, I would have obviously loved to have used a nice independent you know british printer or something like that but yeah it was printed in china and uh it was brought over in a ship and then obviously the evergreen the giant boat that blocked up the suez canal which also caused like shipping delays so in it kept it just kept getting put back and put back until eventually it was like yeah it came out november 21st so. screaming at the tv be like my book needs to come through there <laughs> come on evergreen <laughs> <laughs> The ocean, it's endangered. <laughs> it needs to be sold. Uh, luckily, the book, books don't go off. So, yeah, it wasn't yeah, too bad. Yeah, so. I sell by date. Yeah. Which is cool. Although it is quite funny, sorry, just to add, because we talk about the COVID pandemic in in the book, and we talk about it kind of in the past tense, because when we were, we were writing, <laughs> we kind of predicted that it would come out in June and that COVID would kind of calm down and be something of the past. But, well... <laughs> it continues yeah so. yeah it's like if you if readers recall the covid pandemic of the of 2020 like so far in the future do you remember that distant memory yeah, yeah. oh wow i feel like maybe people need that they just need somewhere to zone out and they're reading it and be like but it's so optimistic <laughs> you know rather than <laughs> like so it's, it's better to play on that i suppose oh that's good so what age would you say that this book is for who is this book for for christmas who's santa going to be buying it for <laughs> well this has been a thing that's really been winding me up i don't know why this is but everyone seems to think it's a children's book like obviously i put stuff out on my social media i was like look i wrote a book and everyone's like oh fantastic i'm gonna get it for my five-year-old nephew like <laughs> I, like nowhere have I said anything that it's a children's book. I'm like, does your five-year-old nephew have a coffee table? <laughs> uh, so, uh, so that's so I've been kind of saying that I think it's for ages ten above. It is an adult book. It's not a kids' book. I mean, it's not that it's full of swear words and boobs or anything like that. But it's um, it's uh, it it is an adult book. The language is adult and the, the references and things like that are in there. But saying that, it's like it's non-specialist. So any big terms like scientific phrase, you know, scientific jargon and things is always explained. And so I, I don't think it's you need to be an adult to be able to access it, if that makes sense. It's just, you know, so I've been saying like 10 plus, but I don't know. Great. What do you think, Celine? Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right. And I mean, there are a lot of photos and pictures. So it's the kind of thing, yeah, a kid could flick through and look at and still see, you know, all different kinds of interesting animals and then ask their parents to understand more about it. But yeah, I would say exactly like Russell says, mm -hmm. the language we use it and the jokes are kind of a bit aimed a bit higher. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of like the books I used to buy at the end of a, like in a gift shop at the end of an aquarium or a museum. And like even as a kid, I don't know how old I, I would have been, but you'd buy it for the pictures. And then as you got older, you're like, oh, there is text too. <laughs> I should love that. <laughs> Love it. Oh, which is which is really yeah. Good. Well, I guess. It, sorry, I, I so I've had a delay. I don't want to talk over someone. No, no I was just okay. you go, Russell. Go, go, go. Okay. Yeah, I was saying, well, I haven't been stopping people if they've been buying it for their for like young kids for exactly that reason. Like I was speaking to my mate about it and he's like, I can think of kids who I would buy an ocean book for, but then the only adults that I would buy an ocean book for were people who were already interested in the ocean. And then obviously the whole point of the book is to try and educate people about the ocean and then you just end up preaching to the converted. So I've been like, just if anyone has been, I'm going to buy it for my nephew. I'm like, go for it because then it gets into the house. Mm -hmm. It gets, they're going to ask parents to read it or whatever like that. So I'm hoping that 
by people actually for randomly thinking it's for kids, it's actually going to get a copy to their house and hopefully the adults will learn for it as well as the kids. So. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, I was wondering if you could both kind of say a bit more, because it, it's really cool, like you said uh, that you've always wanted to write a book. And I mean, that's on people's lists of something that, you know, a lot of people have that in the back of their mind, but never kind of get the chance to do. But also it's really cool that it's just this different way that scientists get to write it. And I'm just thinking as I was buying that, thinking about buying books as a kid of like, oh, you know, that would never have thought to be an option as a scientist writing a book, even though it's a science book. Does that make sense mm. in, a, in a sort of way? Um, so how... I don't know a bit about your background and what your your kind of day jobs are and how that kind of merged into this world where people would ask you to write a book <laughs> which is so cool yeah do you want to go first Celine? yeah okay so well as you said before russell actually asked me uh, to write it because i've been working with incredible oceans for quite a while and like he said he read my thesis and so it was quite interesting to write it uh, along the same like in the same period where I had just written my thesis and then my supervisor had proposed that I try to get it published as an academic article, um, which in the case, which in the end uh, I managed to do and it's now published. So when we were doing the kind of editing, thank you, <laughs> in, in um, kind of September, no, October, when we were doing the final edits, I was kind of looking, I spent part of my day looking at editing, you know, the book and part of the day editing the article and it's it was almost a bit confusing because it's two completely different ways of writing mm -hmm. um, but at the same time it was really refreshing to have the book as an option to kind of express myself a bit more um, descriptively and I remember Russell saying when we first started that I was writing in a way that was really really like academic and sciencey and he was like Celine like lighten up a bit like it's too facty you know like it was it was i was i was actually laughing about that i forgot about that yeah it was like it was like we went we went off and it was like celine got given the polls chapter and she started off writing the polls and it was like the arctic is a is a submerged basin of approximately <laughs> this deep with the following rivers sub introducing this quantity of sediment and she like she did our pomodoro <laughs> thing and then she read it to me. She just went, oh, my God, it's really boring, isn't it? I was like, <laughs> I was like, why are you talking about sediment influx into the Arctic? That's not going to get everyone being like, yeah, let's read about the polar regions. Oh, so so you're like, OK, I'll remove the stuff about sediment. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, as, as time went on, I got a bit more into the kind of descriptive writing phase. But I would say it's definitely a completely different um, skill like this kind of science communication. And for me, that's something super important because so many quote unquote researchers, shall we say nowadays, they publish loads of articles that get stocked in journals, which then not a lot of people read at the end of the day, honestly, to be, you know, a bit negative and definitely not the general public. And that's such a loss of information, all this data and this analysis that's taken place. And we have these results and they're not really shared with everyone. And they're definitely, and even when they're shared and open access, not everyone can access them as in they're not, you know, they can't understand what they really mean. So it's a really important skill as someone who's going to produce any kind of research to be able to actually convey the messages in a, an accessible and understandable way to the general public. So for me, uh, yeah, I get exactly what you say, Elizabeth, when you say that, like, it seems like something so different, but at the same yeah. time, I think it really shouldn't be. And that's something that we should really move towards in the future, if possible. Yeah, I could not agree more. <laughs> Definitely. Well, yeah, on that note, I'm a, I'm a really big fan of the conversation, uh, which is I think I think their buzz line is if you want to if you want to read the headlines, go to a newspaper. If you want to understand the headlines, go to the conversation and they will have a like a really accessible analysis of like current affairs and new things that are happening in the world, but written in a, in a completely unbiased, impartial way by a, a, an academic who's an expert in that field. And um, yeah, it's really accessible and really interesting and all referenced and everything. So uh, um, and yeah, they sign up their newsletter, lands in your inbox at 6 a.m. every morning. I think it's brilliant. So that's where I, yeah. That's one of my to-do lists as an academic is to try and write something for the conversation. So. Oh, nice. 
I, I love that. Yeah, science communication is just it's just fantastic, and I hope that like stuff like this, like talking, like it, it like I. I I just think it would be it's so cool that again we go back to like the thing of like thinking as a thing that I would have people on my channel that have written a book that I get to talk about, but like hopefully by sharing this and stuff that people start to realise that science isn't so rigid and so mm. just this one narrow path that leads you to a lab coat and a lab or a marine biologist and a snorkel and a dolphin or something like it's a lot of different techniques and skills and things and that you can go down this route of like writing books because obviously we'll let you get we all get to learn amazing things and we get to share it uh which is really awesome uh, russell do you want to tell them a bit more about your behind the scenes actual career <laughs> yeah okay so uh for the past five years i've been at university of bath and i've been studying like my, my background's in marine physics and i was a physical oceanographer for a number of years i was a physics teacher for a bit uh, and I've been, so I've taken, I guess my research is looking at how the physics of the ocean impacts the biology. So I've been looking at turbulence and mixing and how, like, how stormy and turbulent the water is and how that affects the phytoplankton that live in there. So little tiny single celled uh, plants that to float around in it. And, you know, I definitely approached my research like an arrogant physicist and thought, oh, plankton, they're just silly little green blobs. The real stuff is going to be like, the, the physics and yeah the, the biology just completely came and like side swiped me and blew me out the water so i've become uh an, like an accidental uh marine biologist uh <laughs> which is which is funny because i go to these conferences and i don't know how to say any of these latin names and things like that because i have no no pre-training in in biology so that's why i mean i don't tell anyone i don't even have science a levels so uh <laughs> So uh, it's like maximum imposter syndrome. So, um, but I guess like uh, alongside the PhD, I've also been uh, like director of a marine education and training uh, non-profit organization called Incredible Oceans. So as well as running events, uh, both online and in person, themed around the ocean, the environment, climate change. Uh, we've been working with academics, uh, specifically environmental academics, on how to communicate better about science. And one of the things that we found is that standard uh, science, communica science communication training is all about, like, don't use big words, make eye contact kind of thing. Uh, but all environmental scientists, marine scientists, climate scientists, ecologists, they the agenda, if you like, for them to communicate to people is that they want to cause behavior change. So they found some information out. They want to give that information to the general public and then the general they want the general public to change their behavior based on the information they've been given. So we train, uh, part of our science communication training is equipping the scientist with uh, what, what we call cultural dynamics, or, and it looks at like how people uh, form opinions and uh, the values that they hold dear to them and how they form uh, like a sense of identity. And by subtly changing the language that you use, you can make the message resonate with them, with different groups of people uh, better. And that's a thing that we try to apply within the book as much as possible as well. So, Great. Yeah. That's, uh again another reason to buy the book and just pointing out your your thing about the i get a lot of questions or like i don't know if you find the same with your science communication where you meet a lot of uh kids or, or adults uh, that are put off because of like not having science a levels or the pressure of exams and stuff it's just good as an example to show <laughs> that it's not the be all and end all at all of getting into science and that it's so much more than just grades which is something i like to share at every opportunity i get <laughs> whenever yeah. I, I see stuff because it surprisingly off-putting for people um and it shouldn't be um I, i've just seen that there are some questions in the the, the comments if anyone mm -hmm. has any questions please shut them in um and we will get to them at the end if that's right with you guys uh in the hot seat make it nice and difficult <laughs> no be nice um i kind of want to talk about so this is gonna uh, when I when I thought about saying this, it's gonna sound like a proper cop out that I've only read you know the first page. But I love the first page of books. Like <laughs> they're, they're, it's because I feel like it's such a choice of like what do you grab people's attention with. The rest of the book is all fantastic, but I just love that within the third paragraph you're mentioning rubber ducks that got washed away and that it was all one ocean. It's not mm. you refer to the whole book 
you only refer to the ocean rather than the different oceans because we're all connected and because of a, a ship that had broke well, not broken down i've forgotten the word a completely a container a container full of a cargo ship yeah that's it <laughs> and and loads of rubber ducks are there and then they they wound up around, they would round wound up around the world well that is more complicated to say than i originally planned <laughs> um i just love that story so much there's a similar one about lego and i just i was like yeah we're off now <laughs> like that's it was the perfect way to start the book um but i was wondering what is your uh both of yours favorite bits that you you managed to get in the book that you wrote that you most enjoyed writing or that you were just most proud of that kind of stuff go on you go Celine. oh well <clears throat> so yeah the different answers i guess um parts that i'm most proud of i guess are the parts where we we show that there are solutions already in place that um for example community-led uh, conservation is effective or i feel that that's really empowering to read things like that and read success stories um and then parts that i quite liked writing well we managed to get a lot of jokes in i think we we made a real effort to keep the tone kind of light and i feel like russell might say some similar stuff um but i remember when i was reading about um parrotfish and um i was like oh yeah so they you know they end up eating a bit of a coral accidentally when they're scraping off the algae and then this gets ground down to make sand and so we thought oh well why don't we add the phrase uh, well, when you're walking on the beach, you know, you're actually walking on a huge pile of parrotfish poo at the end of the day. Uh, so that kind of shocks the people who are thinking of their Caribbean resort holiday or inclusive package, but they're strolling along, oh, beautiful. Oh, well, it's actually parrotfish poo, but well, there you go. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I, I, I like that bit too. It's like, ha ha, you're walking on poo. Yeah. <laughs> you the, can always trust them. Sorry, I was going to say you always trust me, Barges, to, to fit in a way to make it just a little bit <laughs> more, more more disgusting. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, no, it was good. I, I, I guess so our way of writing it, I guess we started off each. Ch so originally, like I said, they wanted us to write all the different oceans. And we said, well, let's do the different biomes. So each, mm -hmm. you know, we've got the poles, we've got open ocean. We've got the deep ocean, we've got the reefs, and we've got the coasts. And so each chapter starts off, like a third of each chapter is like, wow, look at all this cool stuff. And then the, then the middle bit is like, but this is all the bad things that are happening. And we deliberately chose, like, we didn't want to repeat ourselves. And obviously all of the threats, if you like, are pertinent to each area. But like, for example, like for poles, we did climate change. Uh, for the coast, we did things like eutrophication and harmful algal blooms. You know, we did overfishing for open ocean, deep sea mining for the deep sea. So, but then we ended it with a, but look, this is all the cool stuff. This is how, this is what's happening now. These are the improvements that are already being made. This is the new technology, the new solutions that we've got. So I really enjoyed uh, like be it, making sure that it was positive. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's a, a we tried to fill like put a load of really good, like nice little quotes dotted around. Yes. And I, I and I think I'm just trying to find one of the quotes which I really liked because um, it was it's like a, a really difficult thing to talk about without w without it being depressing. Uh, but also while making sure that you're not fobbing people off and pretending that everything's OK. So mm -hmm. it just said. Uh, so it was uh, there's a, an American ecologist called Aldo Leopold and his quote is one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives in a world of wounds. So we kind of put that in the book to let people know. But, I mean, that that's what the intro was about. We we basically just did like cards on the table. This is how we've written the book. So um, I have got my favorite bit. Uh, can, I, can I read this little paragraph? Can I read that? Is that OK? Yeah. So this is. Um, uh, this is in deep sea it's on page 157 and uh, I'd, I'd recently been dumped I'd been dumped the the month before and I think there was this was like quite late at night and I wrote this line and I honestly 
didn't think that it would pass the editor, but it has somehow, and I'm really chuffed with this. I'm going to read the whole paragraph. It's about anglerfish. If you're not familiar with anglerfish, I think most people know them. They're like, basically look like a black football with a giant mouth full of vampire teeth, and they have a little dangly light on the top of their head that they flip backwards and forwards. There, that's mm. what an anglerfish looks like. Thank you, Celine. Right, here we go. So here's, here we go, it's like story time. Right. <laughs> no journey to the deep ocean would be complete without the anglerfish. Best known for their elaborate bioluminescent lures that attract prey, the anglerfish earns its moniker by casting lures back and forth, much as someone does in fly fishing. With large fang-toothed mouths and extendable stomachs, the anglerfish ensures it can engulf its prey no matter what size. Typically no bigger than a football, the anglerfish we often see are females. So that was a female that Celine just showed. The next page, we get to see what the male looks like. Typically, oh no, uh, the male is diminutive by comparison. He lacks a full digestive tract and is dominated by a large olfactory organ to assist him with finding a mate in the deep ocean. It's basically just a giant nose that sniffs out where the yeah. woman is. Come there he is. And you can see that big white thing there on the end of his nose. Oh, there we go. Right. Mating opportunities are few and far between. So once a female is located, the male bites onto her, never relinquishing his grip. Over time, his body is subsumed into hers until only a pair of testes remain, providing her with a constant supply of semen. And you thought online dating was tough. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I was like, they're totally going to delete that. And they didn't. And so it's in the book. I was really chuffed with that last little line. I was like, Celine, can we put this in? She's like, yeah, go for it. I just imagine someone reading that like, <laughs> being like yeah. <laughs> oh brilliant oh i think that perfectly sums up uh the kind of book which is which is really awesome <laughs> i'm glad the anglerfish was there for you russell <laughs> it's good it's good i'm like at least i'm not at least i'm not an anglerfish male that's it you know we've got to get into context <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always vary your life of an anglerfish. That's the that's the baseline level of of living. Um, oh, that was so cool. So after this video kind of ends, we'll share where you will share like a link to where you can buy it. It'll be chucked in the description down below. Is there anywhere else that you can just rattle off that people can go and get this book? Um, There's lots of places. Actually, it's been translated into a lot of languages as well. Um, it's definitely in French, isn't it? It's and, definitely in French, we, probably. I'm not sure all the other ones. And um, uh, we had to go through and we were quite fastidious with making sure we've got imperial and metric measurements in because it is being released in the US as well. So, um, yeah. and North America, uh, yeah, Canada as well. So, um, yeah, so it's definitely been translated into French. I'm not sure what other languages, I can't remember. I should um, ask but them the for a French copy. <laughs> Yeah, Trib, so. yeah. Um, yeah. But so um, there's Flame Tree, where you can buy it directly from the publisher, which would obviously be awesome. Uh, I will say uh, there's also uh, thebookshop.org, which uh, you can buy. It's an online thing, but you buy, you support local bookshops when you buy that. What I will say, like, please don't buy it from Amazon, just because Amazon are a really awful company, both environmentally and in terms of how they treat their workers. And I feel like we could do better things with our money than constantly lie in the pockets of Jeff Bezos. But, you know, there we go. Good point. No. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we move on to some questions? Like, now is your chance to to rattle off you know if anything you want to rant about the book <laughs> any, any particularly amazing things you want to sh share with the world um but if not we can move on to questions um i don't think so i think it's all right we yeah summed it up pretty well yeah right yeah. I, think, I think i mean one of the one of the i guess the other things we were really aware about when writing the book was uh i guess gender bias within that um mm. And that marine, uh, that marine science tends to be really dominated by men. So I think, uh, and we, you know, it, we try to weave it in subtly, but um, most of the quotations in there are, are from female uh, um, uh, marine scientists, uh, which was really cool. And 
And similarly, we're really aware that the domain of marine biology is a really, really white middle class space. So we tried to make sure that if uh, humans were included, that you know, we we had uh, photos of diverse people. So it wasn't just you know more white people. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so those were some of the other considerations that we tried to take into account. So, and additionally, yeah, going from that just the idea that they included pictures of people. Cause I think originally there was kind of this idea it was just pretty pictures of the ocean. Um, even though it was supposed to be a book about the threats and we kind of really pushed for the fact that there would be pictures of people included and not just the negative sides, but the positive sides of where um, cooperation and collaboration have provided solutions. And it was really important to show that we are living and interacting every day with our ocean and uh, to show that visually as well as through the text. Yeah, and, and similarly, I guess, building upon that, there's this idea that, I mean, I think this is like Blue Planet, is that whenever you see the ocean, it has to be beautiful, pristine, blue, super ocean. And actually, uh, you know, the ocean looks very different in different places around the world. And so we try to get like pitch like real like obviously nice pictures to look at but like real ocean uh you know like british ocean where the, it might be a bit murky or a bit gray or a bit stormy so instead of it just being like these beautiful pristine beautiful coral reefs that we see so oh that's great i'm just going to take a slight slight thing out of there just that i can plug myself if you want to see not like amazing looking stuff but all the weird and gross stuff that, that grows in the uk that is uh, amazing then if anyone hasn't yet Please, if you could hit the subscribe button, that would be fabulous. But I will take that away as so we can go back to focusing on the amazing book. <laughs> but <laughs> I can't not take the opportunity up to share just that my channel is for the, the, the weird stuff. Um, <laughs> okay, I, like, so we have I, a... I like the thong weed that you did. I giggled at that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so I wanted to I wanted to find it again for years. I couldn't find it anywhere. I saw it and I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> I can share this with the world, the important stuff. <laughs> um, so we have one question from Pearson Christensen, who says, I have my master's in philosophy, but no official training in marine biology. It has become my new passion, mainly because of orcas. Any advice on how to get my foot in the door and do good work? Mm. Philosophy. Well, I yeah, no go on. Russell. No, no, no. You go on. You, you, you go. No, it depends on what angle you want to go on. I've just, um, having started my masters here in France, I've met a load of people who are kind of doing ecology degrees and ecology, different levels of training from different angles, and there are even people who are doing degrees in um, ecological, like the interface between ecology and philosophy. So that in itself is also a subject if that's something that. In interests you um just to put that out that that does exist as a new domain and it is quite an up coming topic but um russell mm. can probably give some more some other advice as well yeah i mean i i would say i mean one of the biggest mar selling marine biology books um you know in the last five years is other minds by peter godfrey smith uh, which is all about octopus intelligent and uh, octopus intelligence and I believe Peter Godfrey Smith's background is in philosophy. And uh, and he just goes on and it's quite a philosophical book and talks about the nature of consciousness, the nature of intelligence, you know, how. Um, and yeah, he's now one of the world, world's respected, most respected experts in octo, octopus behavior. And, and he has a back, you know, as a philosopher who started scuba diving. Um, I think, I think I'm always a bit, hesitant to say that people should get involved with uh volunteering work because i feel like the marine sector leans so heavily on unpaid internships and volunteers that it it, de it ends up devaluing your skill set um i think so i mean it's obviously if you've got the, m the time and the money to be able to have that freedom to be able to uh to vol you know volunteer for something but i mean I think if you have a background in philosophy, you're clearly good at writing and thinking. So I would maybe look at starting, you know, using uh, like a blogging website like Medium and writing like small articles or blogs or think pieces about, you know, 
things that you're interested in to do the marine uh, the marine environment and where those intersect with with more philosophical discussions. Yeah, and I'll just add a bit of advice in there. Um, if you're because uh, they say that their masters is in philosophy, I mean, PhDs are technically a doctorate of philosophy, mm-hmm. so like there is a lot of, I suppose it's not quite the same as like pure philosophy, but there's a lot of that kind of thinking and making sure that because as you push forward science in a new direction, you have to make sure that kind of follows uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and there are some weird PhDs out there. So, I mean, if you're, you're interested and that's the kind of you want to carry on in that academic thing, it could well be that there will be a supervisor somewhere in the world that is either a philosopher um, wanting to work on something like that and just keep your eye out or get in contact with people that might work at that boundary and see if they will either let you come on board for a project like that or, um, you know, maybe reach out, just have a chat and see if you could do like internships and stuff like that instead of volunteering sometimes they do like paid summer internships in labs and things like that mm. um so keep an eye out for that that might be super handy but good luck <laughs> and also orchids are luck. awesome <laughs> orchids are awesome yeah <laughs> i haven't seen one yet i am desperate I'm supposed to go rock pulling and it was really 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 raining so we went further down where it wasn't raining and then we found out that there's orcas off the coast where we were going to go rock pulling and i was like that is just sod's law <laughs> it still hurts me that <laughs> oh. Oh. well this has been uh amazing thank you so much for coming on to chat about the book it is great i cannot wait to keep going back to all the all the awesomeness that is in ocean cool. endangered cool. We'll pick it up there we go <laughs> It's so heavy. Cheeky cheeky (laughs) screenshot. There we go. Hi, everyone. We own a book. Um, I'd also also (laughs) just like to say that um, Maya Plass, who is uh, an awesome marine biologist, who's based down at the Marine Biological Association. uh, So we have the same agent. (laughs) So I was like, can you get Maya Plass to write the foreword? And so, yeah, that was a a thing that uh, worked out really well. And uh, so, yeah, I'd not met Maya before, and I, I spoke with her at the Young Marine Biologist Conference a couple of weeks ago, and it was really nice to be like, oh, hi, thanks so much for writing the foreword. Uh, so, yeah, no, that was good. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Well, thank you so, so much again. Oh, uh, there, there's another question. Do we have got time oh. for another? Yeah, go on. Last minute question, just snuck it in there. Oh, potentially there related uh i i am glad you enjoyed our granny flat <laughs> sorry uh, that's my <laughs> <favorite>. <laughs> thanks guys thank you for having thank us thank you, uh, you thank you so me. much <laughs> thank you it was a brilliant space to write this book so thank you ever so much for letting us and you're definitely that. getting a free copy <laughs> yeah, definitely there, uh there is a question with that if uh, is there more material that you didn't manage to cover in the book and will there be a sequel hopefully written in the granny flat again <laughs> yeah <laughs> well um so flame tree have expressed an interest in adding to the series so the one before this was rainforest endangered uh uh and but they were talking about they're potentially interested in writing one that's more in depth about the poles um which would be cool and another one about the coasts so i i guess that was that was the struggle for us was to know uh, you know we were like oh we could write i mean you could write an entire book about the poles you could write an entire one around the coast so i'm quite excited about the potential to uh yeah to to kind of build upon that and go be able to go into more depth in those those two chapters so cool i'd love to write a book about plankton so there's any publishers out there (laughs) you want a plankton book (laughs) it's there buzz me on that buzz me there (laughs) awesome well again again thank you so much this has been amazing and uh thank everyone for watching and i'll catch you next week for another video and uh yeah remember head out and uh kiss off a copy for christmas yeah it's brilliant for everyone all ages even like tight babies love it <laughs> <laughs> you can read them in the other <laughs>
they'll come out as an ocean ocean lover. That's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're on such a journey, Russell. You've come for 360 in the space yeah, yeah, of 15 yeah. minutes. Buy it for anyone, even people, especially people who hate the sea. Buy it for them. Oh, that's very true. <laughs> that's a great note to end on. Right. Awesome. Right. Well, Thanks bye, so much. Thanks for having bye, us on. Thank Talk you. See you soon. Cheers. Bye. Bye.